On a calm April morning, a large South Korean passenger ferry suddenly starts listing heavily while making a routine turn while navigating a channel between islands. There are 443 passengers on board, including 325 high school students on a field trip to Jeju Island. The students and passengers are told it's dangerous to leave their cabins, not to go on the outer decks and to stay in their cabins as the ship lists and sinks further into the water. Some ignore the orders and head to the top of the ship. Others place their faith in the instructions from the ship's captain and crew. I've done my best to research this story. Where possible, I've used official reports to confirm details and in places I've abbreviated to tell the story in as succinct a way as possible. This is my understanding of events. If you've researched this more thoroughly or have additional information, please share it in the comments. The Seawall is a Ropax ferry, 145 meters long and 22 meters wide with a capacity to carry 921 passengers, 88 cars and 60 trucks. Ropax means a roll-on, roll-off vessel with passenger facilities. From 1994 to 2012, the Seawall sails in Japan under the name Ferry Namino as a cargo and passenger transport ship for the Japanese company A-Line Ferry. In October 2012, Shanghai Marine, based in Incheon, South Korea, purchases the Seawall from A-Line Ferry. It's already an old and somewhat dilapidated ship. Over the winter of 2012 to 2013, before the ships registered in Korea, they make some fairly major modifications. They add two passenger decks and expand the ship's cargo hold. The Seawall's gross tonnage increases by 239 tons from 6,586 to 6,825 tons, which means the internal volume of the ship is larger. Its passenger capacity increases by 116 people to a total of 956 people, including the crew. The modifications push the ship's center of gravity upward by half a meter and away from the center line. After the modifications are complete, Seawall is inspected by the Korean Register of Shipping and deemed fit for use. During the process of approving the modifications, the Korean Register of Shipping also changes the limits of what the Seawall can carry. They actually reduce the maximum amount of cargo the ship can carry from 1,450 tons to 987 tons, and they increase the amount of ballast needed from 1,333 tons to 1,703 tons. Although Shanghai Marine has increased the volume of the ship's cargo hold and intends for the ship to carry more cargo than before, the ships become less stable because of the modifications, meaning it must carry less cargo and needs more ballast to keep it level. After the inspections, the ship has a further 37 tons of marble installed in the gallery, which I assume is decorative. The ship goes into service in March 2013 with the approval of the Korean Register of Shipping. This is before the final report is released. It's quite difficult to determine the exact timeline, but it looks like the approval is given based on the blueprints for the modifications rather than the actual test report after the inspection. The blueprints turn out to be falsified documents. Almost a year later, the stability test report from the Korean Register of Shipping is finalized and dated the 24th of January 2014. The report states that the seawall has become too heavy and less stable after the modifications were made. This report isn't given to the Korean Shipping Association, which is responsible for managing ferries, or the Korean Coast Guard, which oversees the Shipping Association and safety at sea. Between March 2013 and April 2014, the Seawall sails a regular route between the city of Incheon near Seoul on mainland South Korea and Jeju, an island to the south of the mainland. The captain of Seawall, Captain Shin, warns Shanghai Marine that the Seawall is an unstable ship based on the final stability report. Shin's warnings were relayed to Shanghai Marine through an official working for the Incheon Port Authority on the 9th of April 2014, six days before its final voyage. Shin claims that the company threatened to fire him if he continued his objections. He also requests a repair for malfunctioning steering gear on the 1st of April, which isn't actioned before the ship sinks. 
On the 15th of April 2014, the MSC World prepares to set sail from Incheon to Jeju on its normal route. The ship is scheduled to leave port at 18.30, but fog reduces the visibility to around half a nautical mile, so the port authorities hold its departure. Despite a maximum cargo allowance of 987 tons, the seawall takes 2,147 tons of cargo on board. In fact, some of the ballast tanks are emptied to accommodate cargo. The ship only has 761 tons of ballast on board instead of the 1,703 tons it's registered to sail with. I'm not sure if they intentionally substitute cargo for ballast and calculate the weight distribution or if they're just trying to cram as much cargo in as possible. Either way, the cargo isn't properly secured before the ship leaves port. Fog warnings are lifted at around 2030. At 2100, the motor vessel Seawall sets sail from the port of Incheon in South Korea. The Seawall is the only ship to leave port that evening. It regularly makes three round trips per week from Incheon to Jeju. Each 264 mile leg of the journey takes 13 and a half hours to complete. The Seawall's been covering this route since March 2013, and so far it's made the round trip a total of 241 times. It departs with 443 passengers, 33 crew, and over 2,000 tons of cargo, including 185 cars. Among the 443 passengers on board, there are 325 students and 15 teachers excited about their field trip to Jeju Island. They come from Danwon High School in Anson City near Incheon. The regular Captain Shin is on vacation. The ship is now under the command of 69-year-old Captain Lee Jun Suk, who's recently taken over command of the ship under a one-year contract for which he's paid around $2,500 a month. He's an experienced captain with over 40 years at sea, and he's captained the sea well on this route before. The next morning, 10 hours into its journey, the ship's made good time down South Korea's western coast. Passengers are waking up having spent the night asleep in their cabins. Most of the students are sharing cabins and they've spent the evening and the morning laughing and joking and discussing the trip ahead. The sea wall is southwest of the South Korean mainland, a little way out from the Mangol Channel, between the Mangol Archipelago and the Jiosha Archipelago. I hope I'm pronouncing those names correctly. At 0730, the ship's third mate, Park Han Kul, takes over watch on the sea wall's bridge. Captain Lee is taking a rest in his private cabin. Park is a young and relatively inexperienced ship's officer at 25 years old and with one year's hands-on experience of ship navigation. Five months of that experience comes from working on the seawall. She's navigating the ship with the helmsman Shun Jung Ki at the ship's wheel. The seawall's heading on a course of around 165 degrees at a speed of about 20 knots as it moves towards the Mangol Channel. The Mangal Channel has some of the fastest and most unpredictable tidal currents in the waters of the Korean Peninsula. Sailing through it requires a great deal of caution, but it saves time and modern ships with well-trained crews like the Seawall regularly sail this course. The Seawall's captain has chosen this route to save time following the delayed departure from Incheon. Normally, a more experienced officer would sail this part of the journey, but the delayed departure has also disrupted the watch schedule, meaning that Park is on watch for the ship's passage through the Mangal Channel. Conditions are calm with light wind and swell and good visibility. At 0820, the ship's just over two nautical miles away from the channel. Park orders Cho to change the steering system from autopilot to manual steering. She wants complete control over the ship's steering for this important part of the journey. When the seawall arrives at the channel at 0827, it's on a course of around 137 degrees. The wider areas of the channel contain rock hazards and shallow waters, but there are no dangers in the path the seawall will take. As the ship approaches what will be its final turn, breakfast has been served in the cafeteria. Most of the passengers are up, moving about and beginning their day. The cafeteria is full of students. Other passengers are on the outer deck, smoking, entertaining themselves around the ship, or still asleep. At 0840, Park and Cho are on the bridge, standing side by side near the ship's wheel. 
At 0846, the seawall is traveling at a speed of 18 knots on a course of around 135 degrees. Park orders Cho to change course from 135 to 140 degrees. As Cho alters course, he notices the ship list slightly, but isn't concerned enough to raise this with Park. After Cho alters course to 140 degrees, Park checks that she's happy with the ship's course on radar. At 0848, Park orders another change of course to 145 degrees. Again, Cho turns the ship, but the ship turns faster than he expects and continues to turn after he centers the wheel. Cho quickly makes two turns to port to compensate. In total, he turns the wheel five degrees to the left. The ship doesn't react, it continues to turn right. Park notices the ship is listing heavily and she believes the list is causing the ship to turn quicker to starboard than it should. She tells Cho to turn the wheel in the opposite direction. What she means is to steer the ship to port. She doesn't know Cho has already turned to port. When Cho hears this command, he thinks Park knows he's already turning to port and understands she means to steer the ship to starboard. This is in the direction of the ship's uncontrolled turn rather than away from it. Cho turns the wheel to starboard and the miscommunication between the two sailors compounds the situation for the ship. There's a general sense of confusion and Cho exclaims the wheel isn't working in a flustered voice. In the canteen, people wonder if something might be wrong when they notice that the plates and tables are tilting. But they can feel the ship is turning and assume it's normal. The ship steers 15 degrees to starboard for a total of 40 seconds, but it turns about 45 degrees to the right, then rotates an additional 22 degrees on the spot for 20 seconds. It's like turning the wheel of your car slightly and the back wheels hit an oil patch, then spin out behind you. Soon, the ship is listing quite heavily to port and it's clear that something's wrong. It's possible the currents made the situation worse. Then, passengers hear a loud bang from the lower levels of the ship as the cargo breaks free from its poor lashings. The ship lists further to port. At 0850, the seawall is listing 30 degrees to its left-hand side. The passengers suddenly find themselves on a capsizing ship, the beginning of a tragic fate for some. Captain Lee rushes from his cabin to the bridge. Soon, all the officers are on the bridge. Cho stops the ship's engines and the ship is left to drift sideways. The young third mate Park, who's understandably shocked by the suddenness and severity of the ship's list, starts to cry. Captain Lee and other members of the crew assess the situation and try to decide what to do. Lee can't tell if the ship will sink, but his focus shifts to the safety of the passengers. At 0852, Lee and his crew start planning for rescue while they try to recover control of the vessel. They need to be very careful about how to manage the situation so that everyone can be safely rescued from the ship, if that becomes necessary. The crew start to make announcements to the passengers while the ship is slowly capsizing. They tell everyone not to move, to stay where they are, and it's dangerous if they do move about the ship. These messages go out on the ship's public address system and are repeated until water starts flooding the passengers' cabins. Many of the messages specifically call on Danwon High School students to stay still. Meanwhile, the first emergency call to land is made by one of the students, Choi Duk Ha. At 0852, Choi calls the National Emergency Service number and reports that the ship he's on has begun to capsize. At 0854, Choi is connected to the Mokpo Coast Guard, a Coast Guard station in the southeast of the South Korean mainland, and he explains the situation to them. Three minutes later, the Mokpo Coast Guard orders patrol vessel number 123 to the scene. The vessel is launched at 0858. Following the Coast Guard search and rescue manual, patrol vessel 123 is put in charge of surveying the area and swiftly rescuing passengers. The announcements on the ship's address system continue to say, stay where you are. They're made by the ship's communication officer, Kang Hae Song. He tells everyone that moving around the ship is dangerous. Other crew members repeat this message in person to passengers throughout the ship. When the Costa Concordia capsized, the crew gave similar instructions to stay in cabins and not move around the ship. 
the passengers ignored those warnings and made their way onto the deck of the ship. Quite likely because of an authoritarian culture, the majority of people on the seawall, particularly students of Dan Juan High School, obey the instructions they're given and stay below deck. Video footage taken by the students on their mobile phones will later be recovered from the ship. These videos show the students as they try to understand what's happening on the ship and as they try to deal with the terrifying situation they face. Above all, there's confusion about how serious the situation is. At other moments, there's real fear. They're scared they might die. Others look for life jackets or think about whether the water outside is too cold for them to jump off the ship. They notice things like their shoes starting to slide across the floor. Others can see that the ship looks like it's sinking through the windows. The ship also seems to be getting darker. When will they tell us to evacuate? Are they making the right decision? Isn't this ship sinking? Others try to escape, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to leave the ship walking on walls instead of the floor. At 0855, the Seawall's crew make their first call to rescue agencies on shore. There are calls between the ship and the rescue agencies and between the different rescue agencies. Various Coast Guard agencies are informed as well as the South Korean Navy. Two additional Navy patrol vessels are sent to the scene. Local fishing vessels have already arrived at the scene, some as early as 0900. The rescue agencies discuss the situation with Lee and his crew over radio. At 0920, the Seawall's crew report that the ship's listing more than 50 degrees to port and it's sinking lower into the water. At 0923, the Vessel Traffic Service, who coordinates shipping traffic in the area, orders the crew of the Seawall to inform the passengers to wear life jackets. The crew replies that the ship's broadcasting equipment is out of order and the Vessel Traffic Service tell them to personally order the passengers to wear life jackets and more clothing to prepare for the cold water outside the ship. But there aren't enough life jackets on board for all the passengers. I wonder if that's why they tell Vessel Traffic Service that the broadcast system is down. At 0925, Vessel Traffic Service asks Captain Lee to decide quickly whether to evacuate the ship or not, saying they don't have enough information to make the decisions themselves. In response, Lee asks about the rescue, and the Vessel Traffic Service reply that patrol boats are due to arrive in 10 minutes and that a helicopter will arrive in one minute. Lee replies, there are too many passengers for a helicopter. He decides to continue to tell passengers to stay in their cabins, which Kang, the ship's communication officer, relays over the ship's public address system. It's possible there's a gap in the timeline and the broadcast system is already down. The seawall is capsizing and the passengers are confused. They have to decide whether to follow the instructions from the ship's crew. Some passengers follow the announcements to stay where they are, even as they can see water rising in the ship. Most of the young student passengers continue to obey the announcements. Others move toward the upper decks rather than staying lower inside the ship. Patrol vessel number 123 arrives at the scene at 0930. It's the first official rescue ship to reach the site after the incident. It's appointed commander on scene. During the time between being dispatched and arriving, patrol vessel number 123 doesn't contact the seawall directly on the radio. They call other ships in the area instead. When they arrive at the scene, crew members on patrol vessel number 123 aren't aware of the content of the communication between seawall and the rescue agencies. They haven't spoken to the crew of the seawall and they don't have a clear understanding of the situation. The seawall is listing more than 50 degrees to port. At 0933, after confirming that nearby ships have volunteered to help in the rescue operations, the Vessel Traffic Service tells all ships to drop lifeboats for the passengers. Patrol vessel number 123 begin rescue operations at 0938 when they dispatch an inflatable rescue boat. Rescuers make announcements for five minutes calling for people to abandon ship and jump into the water. The decision to abandon ship is not taken by Captain Lee or the ship's crew. At 0938, communication between the Vessel Traffic Service and Seawall is cut off. About three minutes later, roughly 150 to 160 passengers and crew jump overboard. 
now to evacuate the passengers trapped in the ship. The crew of the seawall need to go below deck in a sinking ship and face near certain death. That doesn't happen. It's simply too late. Passengers on the upper deck and those who jump into the water are rescued. Rescuers are unable to get inside the ship to rescue the trapped passengers because the ship's list is so severe. Amazingly, one of the first people rescued is the ship's Captain Lee, who's photographed stepping from the seawall onto another boat in his underwear. Hundreds of passengers are still inside the ship following Lee's orders to stay where they are while he abandons the ship. Helmsman Cho, along with the first and second mates, are among the first people to be rescued with Captain Lee at 0946. Other crew members trapped inside Seawall's pilot house are rescued after breaking through the windows. Of the 172 survivors, more than half are rescued by fishing boats and other commercial vessels that arrive at the scene before the rescue boats. The Seawall is sinking with hundreds of passengers, mostly children still on board. They've done what they were told and stayed below deck. Their cabins are filling with water and now they have no way to escape. They continue to make calls and send messages from their mobile phones as the ship capsizes and sinks. Some of the messages are to say goodbye, some are to ask for help, and others show that passengers still don't realize what's happening. The last message is sent at 10.17. After the ship sinks, a tragically late sense of urgency takes over as resources are pumped into a desperate rescue operation. Navy ships, including a destroyer and a frigate, are sent to the scene along with other rescue vessels. Aircraft, including several helicopters, are also sent. Rescue personnel arrive, including 40 Special Forces scuba divers, 82 members of the Navy's ship salvage units, and 114 members of the Republic of Korea Naval Special Warfare Flotilla. The Republic of Korea Army send units including 150 Special Warfare Command Soldiers and 11 ambulances. Attempts are made to dive into the ship, but disturbed sediments on the seabed at around 40 meters deep makes it impossible for anyone to get inside. Rescuers are completely unable to get into the ship over the course of the day. At 0030 on the 17th of April, the Coast Guard shoots flares into the sky to illuminate the capsized hull, which is still above the waterline. Eight Coast Guard commandos and Navy divers search for bodies and a possible point of entry into the hull of the ship. By 0600, 171 ships, 29 aircraft and numerous divers are involved in the rescue effort. Throughout the day on the 17th of April, divers continue to try and gain access. By 2200, one day after the ship capsized, the rescuers have only been able to find 14 bodies. It's not until late in the morning of the 18th of April that divers gain access to the ship's hull via the ship's cargo deck. Everyone on board has drowned. In the months that follow, the confirmed death toll slowly rises to 304. Five people are never recovered. The fallout from the sinking of Seawall and the loss of 304 passengers is enormous. The Seawall's captain, Lee Jong Suk, and various crew members are given a great deal of blame for the loss of their passengers. Their failure to order passengers to abandon ship along with their decision to abandon it themselves causes outrage. Within days of the disaster, the entire crew responsible for the Seawall's navigation are arrested. Captain Lee, first mate Kang Won Sik, second mate Kim Yong Ho, and chief engineer Park Ji Ho are all charged with homicide through gross negligence. Arrests are also made at Shanghai Marine, the Korean Shipping Association, and the Korean Register of Shipping. Captain Lee is sentenced to life imprisonment. The disaster goes on to have serious consequences for the government of South Korea and President Park, who was the country's president at the time. Park and her government were accused of being responsible for the lax regulatory environment that allowed the Seawall to sail in an unsafe condition. As well as this, they were also accused of being responsible for the poor rescue operation that was launched for the ship. To make things worse, Park and her government attempted to downplay the disaster and control the public's reaction by controlling the information that was released. Park's popularity as president plummeted following the Seawall disaster and she never regained her popularity.
a few alternative theories have been put forward and subsequently dismissed, including an explosion, hitting a reef and colliding with a submarine. As with many large-scale accidents, there's not one isolated event that led to this disaster. Modifications changed the ship's center of gravity based on documents that were falsified to get approval. After testing the stability of the ship, those results weren't shared with the authorities that regulate the safety of commercial ships. The ship wasn't properly weighted with ballast and the cargo wasn't secured to prevent it shifting during the voyage. An inexperienced crew were left to navigate the most dangerous section of the water on the route. After it became clear the ship was in trouble, the passengers were told to stay below decks and they listened to those orders. When rescue agencies were informed, they didn't take control of the situation until it was too late. Despite making the first emergency call, Choi drowns in the capsized vessel and his body is later recovered from inside the ship. The order to abandon the ship was never given to the passengers below deck. Although the passenger count was lower than the Costa Concordia, the death toll was higher. In both instances, the captains were amongst the first to leave the vessel. I'll leave a link to the story about the Costa Concordia here.